Okay, so hi everyone. Um, my name is Ron Kukiroga and we are here with Miss Taylor today um, for our third interview for the Bronx COVID-19 project. All right, hi, my name is Bethany Fernandez and, and I'm here also to participate in the interview with Miss Taylor. Hi, and I'm Marlene Taylor. I am a graduate of Fordham, the class of 1979, and it's an honor to be asked to interview during this important time in uh, the history of the Bronx, uh, COVID-19. So Ms. Marlene, could you just start by talking to us a little bit about what you do and about your position? Okay. So I am a primary care physician assistant um, I practice medicine at a clinic in Midtown called the Ryan Chelsea Clinton Clinic. Um, after graduating from Fordham in 79 with a bio degree, I apply to a PA school and a physician assistant is on primary care. So depending on your specialty, you can work in several specialties, but the profession came about after the Vietnam War when a lot of uh, medics came back with skills and they had a lot of uh, people coming back who had the ability to diagnose, treat, suture, uh, diagnose and treat and really um, came up with the first PA school, um, actually uh, Duke University. And so um, the profession evolved to now where um, they're you know, thousands of PA schools around the country, usually part of medical school where uh, as a postgraduate student, you um, go through a two and a half year training um, after undergrad, and then you obtain a license um, to practice medicine and you have to pass the national board. Um, and then your medical training is updated every six years. So I practice um, in a clinic where I have over 300 patients. Um, currently, um, as I mentioned, in uh, Midtown Manhattan, um, a lot of patients I've had for 15, some out to 20 years, who've gone with me at the various institutions where I practice. So, yeah, and I specialize um, in, in infectious disease and HIV. Wow. So, is it a more local clinic, or would you say that it's very popular in terms of, not popular, but very um, high dense and yes, yeah, so it is. Um, the clinic has about seven thousand patients. Um, um, sometimes, um, you know, because of where it's located. So the Ryan Clinic, there's several throughout New York. Um, there are two in Harlem. There's one on the Upper West Side on Ninety Seventh. There's one on the Lower East Side, and we're placed, as I mentioned, in Midtown Manhattan. So it is a federally qualified health center, which basically um, was started after an assemblyman uh, back in the 1970s saw that there was a need to address underserved populations who may not have had insurance and were in some cases undocumented. And their motto is healthcare is a right, not a privilege. And I can certainly say that we never turn anyone away. So patients who come in the doors um, may live in the neighborhood, may live anywhere in the world. So I see patients who um, have basically every ethnicity. Um, and as I mentioned, the, the nice thing about that practice is that they don't have to worry about um, having insurance. If they don't, we still see them. Um, yeah, so it's, it's pretty rewarding working there where if patients have a healthcare problem, they still can be seen um, by a, a medical provider. Okay, okay. So it's good to hear um, a little bit about your work life. Um, we'll go back to that and we'll talk a lot more about that. But just before we do, I'd also just like um, to get, in, get to know you a little more, um, just what your household is like and how Ooh. things have changed in your household ever since this started. Do you also live in the Bronx? Yes, I do. So I've lived in Riverdale, part of the Bronx, for the last 25 years. Um, I'm originally from, I was born in Philadelphia, and my family moved to New York 
in the late 60s and we moved to uh, upper Manhattan, uh, the upper, I guess it's now called Sugar Hill part of uh, Harlem. So it was like near City College, uh, 143rd between Amsterdam and Convent Avenue. And then shortly after that, we moved to the Polo Ground houses um, where I lived until um, after graduating from Fordham. Um, the Polo Grounds is on 155th Street, 155th and 8th Avenue. So it's one of the historical parts of Harlem um, where uh, they have a Willie Mays field, which is part of um, where, you know, the baseball player Willie Mays, um, it's named after him. So most of my um, formal formulative years, I want to say, were right there in Harlem. And Harlem is still near and dear to me. Um, when I got married, um, I moved to Riverdale. It was just basically one of the first uh, nice apartments that we um, came across. And um, I've been here ever since. I'm married for 25 years. Uh, my husband, Fred Ponterato, um, who's part of the Italian American History Project um, and went to Iona College. Um, and his brother is actually a professor at the Lincoln Center uh, campus, uh, Joseph Ponterato. So, um, and I actually didn't know all this before I met Freddie, but, um, you know, our worlds uh, joined with so many similarities and so many things in common. Um, but the bottom line is I, um, you know, we've lived in Riverdale. Um, I have two sons. Uh, I had mentioned Jason earlier to Bethany, who's home now. He's a junior at Howard University and he was part of the STEP program um, when he was in high school. And uh, my son, Christopher, who is 25, uh, after studying abroad uh, one year in college, he decided he loved Europe. So he actually lives in Luxembourg for over the past year and he's working there in marketing. Um, so yeah, and I you know, have other things I do on the side. My, I'm passionate about my involvement as a Fordham alumnus, um, as the, uh, one of the members at large for the organization Mosaic, which is a multicultural organization, which was started a few years ago um, out of the foundation of the Black and Latino um, organization alumni association which had been around for years and I have to thank Mark Nason for my continual involvement as an alumnus um, with Fordham which is basically um, you know an extension of who I am and what they stand for and uh, again it's it's an honor to do this and to be part of um, something that the university um, supports and you know, which is just really a great opportunity. Fordham means a lot to me. You know, it sounds corny, but it it really is. I'm I'm so my you know my years there. I can't say enough about, and you know for sure what it continues to be to me. So yeah, that's me, and and you know pretty much my home life, um, my spiritual life. I um, belong to a parish in Harlem where my dad was very active, a non denominational church called the Christian Parish, and I'm able to um, be involved in several ways to help with healthcare um, issues. I started a mentorship program for um, students who are interested in the health professions through the uh, parish called the Taylor Moses Institute. And we, um, you know, students who can rotate with me either when I practice that Montefiore or at my current practice at the Ryan Center, but also just doing a lot for the community. So um, they hold a health fair every year. And yeah, so it's, you know, I have a pretty full life with um, my Fordham family, my Harlem family, and of course at home and my, my patients. That's very good to hear. Thank and heartwarming and also just encouraging uh, being that um, so Bethany's a junior, as I'm sure she told you, but mm -hmm. I'm a junior, so I'll be graduating from Fordham in just a few weeks So it's very encouraging to hear um, that you're still very much a part of the community and that mm -hmm. uh, through your work that you did with Fordham, you were able to get to where you are now. So that's Thank always you. encouraging to hear to, for a graduating senior to hear. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, yes. Dr. Nason, Dr. Nason, I actually had a question for you because he did mention um, just the renowned work that you've done with the HIV slash AIDS community. 
So um, mm -hmm. if you could talk to us a little bit about that, mm -hmm. and um, you already started talking a little bit about where your interest and passion lies. So I think yeah, I think it's pretty big. Great. So I started, so as a PA, you know, you get a job uh, working either in a hospital or in clinics, but when my second position as a PA was at a hospital in lower Manhattan called Beth Israel, which is now part of the Mount Sinai uh, uh, branch of uh, Mount Sinai. So Mount Sinai has what was formerly known as St. Luke's, what was formerly known as Beth Israel, and um, what was formerly known as Roosevelt Hospital. And so at Beth Israel, the PAs who worked on the chemical dependency unit actually saw patients, diagnosed them, treated them. And this was like 82 to 92 before you both were born. So like 82 to 92. And we um, uh, essentially, you know, patients who were former intravenous drug users, patients who were impacted or affected by the crack epidemic, alcohol alcoholism and you know pretty much it was a job and you see diseases and really saw health disparities but then we started noticing in the mid 80s a lot of patients getting sicker quicker they would develop not only the regular diseases that you see associated with chemical dependency like abscesses or dt's or liver disease but we started seeing fevers and lymphadenopathy, which is enlarged lymph nodes, pneumonias that we had never seen before. And lo and behold, that was the initial years of the HIV uh, epidemic. Um, and patients would die quickly and we would transfer them to the acute unit and we pretty much never saw them again. Um, over time, I worked in uh, Mount Sinai on the floors where in the mid 90s, we saw patients coming in with these what we call opportunistic infections, which were the infections that they usually succumb to. Um, I made a lot of friends with a lot of the medical attendings. And as a PA, it's like you're the hands of, if the attending physician is not there, then you are practicing medicine for them. If they're in the clinic, you're on the floor seeing the patients. So a lot of them, um, uh, we became very close. I met a lot, a lot of uh, moms who I was just really inspired by the fact that they can be mothers. And I was, you know, still, um, you know, cr my older son was like one or two years old. And I remember thinking, so I can still practice medicine and become a mom. And these amazing women who were just, just really inspired me. So they later offered me positions in their various clinics on an outpatient basis. And that's when HIV was becoming such a chronic disease that you can handle treating these patients as though it's a chronic illness, much like diabetes, hypertension, asthma. So in the late 90s, I started working in an outpatient clinic at St. Luke's Roosevelt. And then I developed um, and actually um, had patients who followed me from St. Luke's onto uh, a clinic, a hospital-based clinic in central Harlem which I feel like was the foundation of my career as an HIV specialist, North General Hospital, which is lo was located on 122nd and uh, Madison Avenue. It's no longer there, it closed in 2010. However, the patients who followed me from there and went on with me to Montefiore um, are patients who have been infected by this disease sometimes out to 20, 25 years. Um, I was one of the providers, so they're physicians, so medical providers are either MDs, PAs, or nurse practitioners. And we have uh, patients who we treat for this illness, which has now become, as I mentioned, um, just treatable and much like uh, other diseases where you take one pill a day, and that's, we've come so far from multiple pills where patients had severe side effects to basically being able to tolerate the treatment to the point that they just take it like a vitamin every day. Um, but we do have to monitor, of course, them with various lab tests every three months, looking at their T cell and viral load, which are basically markers of their immune system, and basically to ensure that the medication is working to uh, make sure that they're undetectable. And undetectable basically means that they can no longer transmit the virus to another person. Um, depending on the risk group that they're in, right? So people can 
uh, have acquired HIV either by sexual transmission, either by what we call vertical transmission from mother to child, or um, in the um, men who have sex with men, they may not define themselves as gay, but that risk group or one of the groups that we see still um, where the numbers continue to rise. But the other risk groups, the numbers have also have definitely diminished. Um, the intravenous drug users, which was one of the highest group uh, risk groups in the in the 90s due to harm reduction, which basically helps address if they're going to use drugs, how to use it safely so that those numbers started to decline. So being involved with my patients and their advocacy and initiatives, but more importantly, treating the disease and educating the community, because I have patients who um, unfortunately still continue to um, not take their meds the way they're supposed to be. And so I have patients who have passed away, but the majority of my patients are living along, going back to school, going back to work, having children, just becoming productive members of society. And that's because of all the advances we've made in HIV. Yeah. That's actually really awesome to hear like that, you know, you were able to um, work through a lot of these sort of issues and be involved in that. And so I would have to ask, like, what has your experience with working with H HIV patients sort of informed, like, the stuff that's going on with the new, with a new outbreak, with a new pandemic mm -hmm. of, like, the coronavirus? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. So my patients, of course, are very concerned. I get calls every day, um, even today when I was not even working in the clinic but they are afraid because as you know, the patients who are highest at risk for decompensating and really uh, not doing well with regards to coronavirus are those at risk. And that includes the elderly, those with underlying immune issues um, and, the, and, and you know, depressed immune system. And those patients who have comorbid conditions like heart disease, like lung disease and like uh, patients who have cancer and who have just recently undergone chemotherapy. So because HIV is a disease which does impact the immune system, my patients, regardless of their numbers, are still concerned. The CDC, which um, determines uh, for the most part like what the guidelines around coronavirus are on a daily basis. Things are changing all the time. So initially my patients were like, we're at risk, what do we do? So they came out uh, a few weeks ago with specific guidelines and recommendations. And those include things that we automatically know as HIV primary care practitioners, which is if your immune system is below um, 200, so your CD4, which is a marker of your immune function, a normal number is somewhere between 500 and 1,500. If you have a CD4 that's below 200, that means a patient has AIDS, which is significant immunosuppression. Those patients I have to prescribe not only their medications called antiretrovirals, but I also have to prescribe an extra medication that actually works to prevent them from developing pneumonias. So a specific pneumonia that used to kill people back in the old days called PCP pneumonia. So my patients, which are very few at this point, but my patients who do have a T cell below 200, they're patients who would be at risk more than the other patients who have stable immune systems. The other thing is if they're not on medication. So if their viral load, which is the amount of virus that's in their body, and the goal of the medication called antiretrovirals is to make that undetectable. But if they're not on medication, they have the virus running around in their blood and basically it causes disease. And the premise for HIV is inflammation. So it causes inflammation in every system in their body. If they're not virologically suppressed, then they're also at risk for developing other diseases and coronavirus is one of them. And the other thing are patients who are just not on treatment. So those who may know they're positive and never for whatever reason wanted to get into treatment, those patients are at risk as well. So I have patients calling all the time. Um, the nurses have a long list of like, this one wants to, you know, and if they can address it, fine. But when they are, when they have an appointment with me, I try to not only 
do what they need to have done for that specific visit. But I also start off with asking them how are they doing and if they have any questions around COVID-19, just to reassure them um, and to be able to give them concrete medical information. Because as you mentioned earlier, Bethany, there's so much stuff out there. And Veronica, I know you mentioned as well, there's so much you know, in the media, there's so much on the internet and patients really need to feel comfortable and their anxiety um, addressed by their primary care provider, who, which I am. So I know that you mentioned that, um, like a lot of the stuff that you probably say were guidelines that were issued by the CDC mm -hmm. was information that, um, you know, like people working with uh, HIV patients um, sort of no knew before. So like, would you say that your job like changed significantly during the outbreak or was it just more like, you know, more tending to like the anxieties and fears of um, mm -hmm. like your, the patients that come your way? Right. So you have to kind of do both. So even though, again, I'm their doctor, I still have to make sure that the dots are connected, right? So there's a team of, there's the nurses, there's the front desk, um, there are the social workers. Um, and there are, we actually have a group of, uh, I call them students, because they're like, um, most of them are, uh, have graduated college already, AmeriCorps workers. So they do a lot to help us out. But basically, um, the way my job has changed um, in terms of what I do every day. So in the past, you know, there's a an appointment um, every day I look at my screen and I see who has an appointment with me and then I go to the clinic and the nurse calls them in and does their vitals and by the time I get to the room their vitals are done and I have a visit and do their physical and make a diagnosis and give send a prescription electronically and you know we talk a little bit I know how the kids doing whatever what <laughs> my patients have known for years it's like it's their birthday or they you know what's going on with school but basically it's diagnosing whatever is new um now the visits have changed to what we call telehealth visits so my patients are not too happy because i don't get to see them uh, much like a zoom uh type of communication um i the nurse is still um room them and put them so there's there's three parts of telehealth visits they're the ones where even though i go into the clinic three days a week i'm in my office upstairs so i'm no longer down in the clinic unless i have to do a procedure for example a gyn exam like if a patient doesn't want the male gynecologist but she's um she's in for a visit for gyn then i go down if someone a few weeks ago, a patient had ear pain, and so I have to look into the ear, um, I can't do that by telehealth. So I went there and, you know, he needed an irrigation. And uh, so I did that procedure. So if there are procedures, if there's a rash, um, I need to see that, even though people can show it on a screen, I need to examine their skin because a raised, raised lesions mean one thing, indurated lesions mean something else. There's a lot in the terms of dermatology that I need to see. Um, so, so the way my job has changed is most of my visits are telehealth. Um, telehealth includes a web-based uh, feature in the electronic medical record where I can see the patient and I basically go through all the questions with them. They are usually get a link um, that they click on and then we spend 20 minutes and that's the visit. I can send the prescription still electronically to the pharmacy. And, you know, so that's one thing. Um, televisit, telehealth is when they, they don't have an email address, like many of my patients don't. Um, so for some of them, I call them on the phone. And even though, you know, we're told that, that they can bill <laughs> as much for that, um, but I still get to find out what's going on with them and what their needs are. Um, so I will still send a prescription. I'll go back to the computer and send it electronically. Um, so then there's a visit where they still insist on coming in. So they come into the clinic and the nurse puts them in a room where from my office, it's called life size. I can see them on that screen upstairs. 
but I don't go downstairs if it's not related to a physical um, issue. If a patient comes in, so we have, of course, implemented certain policies in the clinic around COVID-19. When anyone comes to the door, even the staff, a nurse is there with a thermometer and she takes everyone's temperature. She also screens patients for COVID-like symptoms. So if patients, for example, they're asked, have you had a cough? Have you had a fever? Were you diagnosed with COVID any time in the past 30 days? Do you live with someone or were you exposed to someone with COVID in the last month? If they, what's called screen positive, then they're taken directly by a nurse into an isolation room. And then the medical staff, myself and my colleagues are alerted so that we go and see those patients. Before we go in the room, of course, the nurse gives us the goggles and the um, draping of this um, coat, lab coat, not lab coat. It's actually the PEP, the protective gear, which we wear, um, as well as you know gloves, and an N95 mask that we all were fitted for, the medical staff is fitted for that. And then we go and see those patients to determine one, if we have to get them hospitalized or if they can be, um, sometimes the nurse might get no temperature, but the patient may say they cough. Um, so these patients are screened like, so like it's, this virus is very tricky because it doesn't really follow the usual viral clinical presentation. I had a patient who was, he had been exposed to, so this is what it does. Um, you would think that people have symptoms, the nurse gets a temperature, they go to isolation. And so this patient had no symptoms for the past month. He came in because he needed a letter from me to say he can go back to work. He has a landlord who was tested positive. He was really not around the landlord, but he was concerned because earlier in March, he was coughing. So here it is uh, mid-April and I'm seeing him and he's totally asymptomatic, no temperature. The nurses just bring him in the regular room. I go in to just give him, write a letter and examine him. And he said he felt the sensation of something in his chest. He wasn't coughing, but he just felt like there was something in his chest. So I ordered a chest x-ray and within an hour, the radiologist called me back to say, this patient has bilateral um, ground glass appearing in uh, opacities, which is the way that the COVID pneumonia looks on x-ray. It doesn't look like a regular pneumonia where you have an infiltrate, like on one side of the lung, you have these both lungs, bilateral, ground glass, very classic appearing opacities. So here he is sick from a month ago. So it's now like six weeks since he had symptoms. He self-quarantined initially for two weeks. Um, he came to see me like early April and I'm like, let's just, you know, let's wait. And he didn't tell me about the fullness in his chest back then. Anyway, so the day he wanted to come in, he has this pneumonia. So I admitted him to the hospital. He was there for a few days. They repeated, um, they said, follow up with me. I just cleared him to go back to work today because I ordered an x-ray last week and it showed improvement. And we also did a COVID-19 uh, swab, which was negative. That was done April 30th. So he can now go back. But the takeaway is this virus is very tricky. And so we have to do everything to really determine what's going on with that patient. Um, so, you know, the layout of the clinic has changed, how I go into work. I see patients um, Monday and Tuesday from home, I do the televisits. So I had like 17 patients yesterday, back to back. Um, I also had the luxury of my scribe. So a scribe is a person who takes, um, fills in the medical records for me, and I just look at it and send it after if it's done correctly and so that that's like a quicker way to to do billing um but yeah the scribes are usually when i see patients in the exam room with me and just take documenting everything i say and do so that the note is completed um, in a timely fashion so i was able to have the scribe on my work phone 
while I was seeing the patients yesterday from home. So that, that's all like a new world, you know? And some of my patients are not happy with that. They, they feel a lot of anxiety. talk to me about their lives. And so I think they miss that. And I've had patients feeling really depressed and crying on the phone and, you know, and so I think the mental health providers are desperately needed. Um, I've made a lot of referrals to our um, therapists um, to try to get them to be able to have those type of visits with them, telehealth um, visits, um, which they, are, they offer for patients. Um, just to kind of address their anxiety and fear around this pandemic. Yeah. Wow, so, I mean, that's, inc that's really all just some incredible work and not only, I mean, I, I know I speak on behalf of the community when I say that we're extremely grateful uh, for the people yeah. like people who are on the front line for you. Thank you. Um, Thank just, you going out there every day. And um, even when you're not out there, you're at home still helping. Thank you. Um, so talk to us just a little bit about that, about how the experience has just overall affected you um, in your own household and mm -hmm. how your workplace has sort of worked to alleviate some of the stress on the employees since we talked great. a lot about education. That's a great question, Veronica. So, um, so I'll start with the latter part first. So they have, I mean, I have to say my medical director, I'm the assistant director of HIV and addiction medicine, as well as a primary care provider. So I see not only HIV positive patients, but I have patients on my schedule who may just be coming in for physical um, or just may be coming in for a refill of medications or patients who have some ailment, um, which, you know, is just um, a rash or sore throat or, um, various things. So there, I see both HIV positive and HIV negative. My director is one of the most amazing women who I've ever had the, the honor of working for. Um, I do have hypertension. I am 62. And she looks at that as, you know, I don't want you, um, if you don't have to, like be to see, to examine patients, if there's a way. So she quickly um, enforced this policy where the providers um, learn telehealth and televisit. So that's where the whole center, um, the entire Ryan uh, Center, so the ones uptown in Harlem, the ones in the Lower East Side, and of course the one on 97th Street and ours, implemented this new televisit where we have minimal exposure to patients and don't put ourselves at risk. Um, so making sure that when it came to working from home, that it was fair. And so I have Monday and Tuesday where I am at home. Um, so my son, uh, Jason, who is 20, 21, he is home from Howard University. Um, he was coming home for spring break in March and wind up, of course, staying the whole time because they mentioned the week that they were set to leave campus that they would no longer um, come back after spring break and that they would make arrangements for getting their um, whatever they left in their dorm. So as a mom, I'm like, what's going to happen? Like Howard is in DC, like, how are we going to get your stuff? But it's sort of like he was able to, of course, you know, complete the rest of the semester at home, you know, web-based classrooms. Um, and, you know, of course, my husband and I were, had like an empty nest <laughs> for a little bit um, because our older son actually lives in Luxembourg. He went to um, study abroad a few years ago and realized he loved Europe. Um, my husband is Italian American and has two sisters who live in Rome. So I have um, family in Europe and Christopher, you know, has that gene of the European piece and just loves everything about Europe. But of course, as a mom, I'm, you know, um, and Luxembourg is, is housed right between Germany and France. And he uh, speaks French fluently and first lived in Montpellier, where he attended uh, Paul Valéry University. So he finished up school there um, and then fell in love with Luxembourg. Um, so he's working there. But as a mom, of course, you know, um, 
I'm worried, um, even though he is 25. Um, he started to develop uh, symptoms of diminished taste and smell, which I had heard from several of my patients and actually was um, instrumental in adding that to our list of questions that the nurses have to ask patients because losing your taste and smell. Um, I started hearing that back in February and I'm like, that's a common symptom um, that I keep hearing. And of course the CDC recently within the last two weeks added it to the list of COVID type uh, symptoms to screen for. But so a little worried that he developed those, but they came back within two weeks. And I'm sure, you know, so many people have probably been exposed to this virus. It's just that small percentage of patients who do decompensate clinically. And those are the patients who are usually the elderly, usually those who, are, who have comorbid conditions like significant lung disease or heart disease um, or are significantly immunosuppressed. Um, so, so my job has changed to get back to the subject. So my job has changed in that my, my boss is great with having the clinicians as well of, you know, the head of nursing is over the nurses who make sure the nurses rotate. Um, but my specific role as one of the providers has changed where I don't have to see the patients face to face because as we know, and as we've learned from this virus, you can be totally asymptomatic, but be a carrier. So as my patient with the abnormal chest x-ray showed me, he was just coming in for a letter and had a, an active uh, pulmonary process, uh, which was a pneumonia. So, um, and then after another two weeks, we checked him and his COVID test was, COVID-19 uh, swab was negative. So work has changed. Um, home has changed. I do have my husband and son take their shoes off at the door, go right to the bathroom before you come into the rest of the apartment. <laughs> um, you know, uh, my husband is a little older than me. So clearly we're both, you know, over um, 60 and, uh, you know, the older generation, even though we're not, um, <laughs> I don't want to think that that I'm geriatric, but we are at risk because of our age. So, you know, I'm vigilant with adhering to the guidelines around um, just, you know, reinforcing the hand washing, et cetera, at home. And since I do come home after being in a clinic and after traveling, even though it's the Riverdale Express bus, I still have to take a bus to that bus. And um, so I, you know, wear scrubs underneath my white jacket and usually just go right to the bathroom and change those into something after shower. So being out in the public and potentially being exposed, it's important to really not bring anything home um, to, to the household. Yes. So it sort of changed a lot. Right. So I know that, oh. Go ahead. Go ahead. So I know that you've been talking about your transition to like online, uh, like telehealth and online sort of health work. But how would you say that like the transition to more telehealth and like online health work has probably affected your patients just in like terms of accessibility? Because you did say that like your patients don't have emails sometimes that you can reach out to them with and things like that. Mm -hmm. So I have a work phone that um, my patients from Ryan mostly have, my patients who I've had for like 15, 20 years, they actually have my cell phone number. My director thinks I'm crazy. But my patients, when I switched, when I was off for the position at Ryan, I was concerned about, they were more concerned about the transition. And I never want them to feel helpless or, you know, just staying, they're like, we're going with you. We came with you, we came with you from, St. Luke's to North General, and now we went from North General to Monty. We're not staying, we're not staying here. So they are very, um, so I actually, they have my cell phone. I do tell them to text me first, so I know it's them, and be specific. Um, so we have sort of a routine that I already established with my patients. Um, I was just gonna pull up one today. So they, you know, I, I, I tell them I get back to them in the morning before I get to work. So between eight and nine when I'm on the express bus or after five, if it's an emergency, they can send me a text and let me know. But um, 
we have a routine that's that's worked out for the patients who I acquired at Ryan, who they added to my schedule. Um, I use the work phone. We have several features on the phone, one called Doximity, which is for healthcare professionals, where the patients don't really see that number, but they see the clinic number and you call them. And that's sort of like a, you can utilize the video um, feature there. Um, so that's Doximity. And as I mentioned, for the actual visits, we can use FaceTime, we can use Skype, or we can just speak to them and do um, a voice uh, visit with them. So it takes a while. I think for the patients I don't know that well, um, it's okay because they understand. My patients who are HIV positive, who have a, I have a closer relationship with just because of the time that I've known them. Um, and we've been through so much together, like they are, you know, as I mentioned, they've gone back to school, they've graduated, they have children now, their grandchildren have grown up with me. Like there's so much that we've gone through together. This is yet another significant and something unprecedented. Like we never have, you know, we went through them with 9-11, um, possibly some of their hospitalizations and of course their HIV diagnosis, but this is something we could have never have imagined. So they, I definitely always want to reassure them. Um, I was actually going to play one of their voice messages that they leave me um, that it sounds, you know, if they're in distress. Um, so this is like one patient. I'm not sure what she's saying, but. Okay, so, okay, so this is, I don't know. Hi, Dr. Taylor, you know, I'll try to get to see how you're doing on Sundays because I know you'll be working. I'm just calling to see how you and your family doing. I love you, Dr. Taylor, and have a blessed day. If you have time, I know you're out there busy and tired and stuff. If you have time, give me a call. I love you, Dr. Taylor. So that's that's one who calls almost every day. <laughs> she, calls, she calls every day with the same voice. Um, there are, let's see, other than Maria, let's see. She... Um, so this is, okay, this is another patient. Sorry to bother you, Dr. Chella. I know. I, I didn't even want to talk. I didn't even want to call you this time. The thing, the, the medication you changed for me is triple. You need to call him and tell him what it is, but he doesn't even have it. Thank you. Problems at the pharmacy. But I could hear the anxiety in his voice. Um, and, yeah, so there are multiple messages. This is a patient who's not in care. Dr. Taylor, this is Nadine. I just called me to see if you're all right. I'm doing all right. I still got some of my HIV medication, so I'm still, I still don't have no doctors, but I'm doing all right. I'm staying in the house and being safe. Thank you and God bless you and keep you safe and be safe. Okay, so she has yet to come see me. Another provider transferred her to me. And so she calls every few months just to tell me how she's doing. Um, so I have multiple, these are patients who I've had for years, except for her. She was at North General. This one is super anxiety. Dr. Taylor, could you please call me? It's James Jameson, this is Bobby Nelson, thank you. <laughs> Um, so there's, okay, I saw no. my paper, the, the paper is uh, at two o'clock, uh, I'll be waiting for your call. So he's okay. getting used to the, Thank uh, you. to the telehealth, um, visit. So there are so many, um, messages. So that's how I stay in touch with them. <laughs> they leave me messages, um, in between the visits, even though technically, the person at the front desk is supposed to schedule those visits. Sometimes they are, the patients are not really pleased with them. Um, they're like, what, I'm not gonna see you. So this is someone who's actually very sick right now. He stopped taking his meds. Um, I'm not sure if it'll work, but he's very sick. I've had him for 25 years and he is now um, in the ICU at a Bronx Lebanon hospital actually. Um, but anyway, enough of my, but I, you know, um, yeah, it's not easy for them. 
um, you know, even though clinically they're fine, I think the mental health piece is important. And unless they have a relationship with the therapist, um, it's hard for them to try to connect all of a sudden um, with someone um, because it's it's just, you know, it's it's not easy. This is scary for everyone. So imagine, imagine them, you know. Um, which, which makes complete sense. And thank yes. you so much. Yes. Um, for sharing that with us, Dr. Taylor. So um, just hearing some of and how do you think that some of the concerns and some of the anxieties that your patients are sharing and expressing to you sort of connect um, to larger or more systemic issues that you believe others could also be experiencing? Mm -hmm. So for sure, um, I believe that so that's, that's such a huge and very important question. And thanks for asking that. Um, so it opens up the dialogue around, you know, in general health disparities, right? Around, around chronic illnesses, but then how it impacts those who are already marginalized in society. So I wanna say this is um, a great equalizer having this pandemic, not that any of us asked for this, but to have people sort of all on the same page and as far as helplessness. However, I believe strongly that those who are already underserved and from a healthcare standpoint um, are more, feel more distressed because if they already had challenges with getting medication, food, housing, um, they, now there are more obstacles and more challenges so those who maybe never experienced anything like this or even had issues on a day-to-day -day basis with getting to work, the supermarket closing, the, um, you know, the pharmacies having long lines, they have to see like, welcome to, to our, I wanna say welcome to our world or welcome to the world of my patients who this is what I had a patient um, the other day. She um, said, oh my God, you know, she, she called, she's not one of my traditional patients, but when I was on call, she called the call center and then we have to call back and speak to the patient. And so she's like, oh, I need my migraine medicine. So, okay, so I wrote that, but I said, you need a visit um, to come in because she hadn't had lab tests in like a year. So she actually called and left me a message on the work phone yesterday that, oh, you know, I can't get to, I can't get to the clinic um, I have a toddler with special needs. Um, they put me in a shelter in the Bronx where I don't know anyone. Um, and I'm having a hard time with all this. And those are the conversations that I heard from my patients where all, you know, for decades where they're housed every 28 days, even though they do have some benefits being HIV positive, however, the housing that they automatically are eligible for may not be in the most ideal neighborhood, but if it's all they have at the time, then that's where they have to go. They um, are used to maybe having children whose needs are never met because they're too busy um, trying to just find a place to live or find out an appointment with around their insurance. There's all these um, things that they are faced with on a day-to-day -day basis. So to hear this woman who um, had not lived in um, underserved community, but all of a sudden she had to, um, not that I was not sensitive to her needs, but I felt like, okay, this is what my hundreds of patients deal with every day. And so guess what? You know, um, I'll send one month prescription, but no refills because you have to find a way to get in here to get your labs done because that's my license on the line more importantly, to give her her medication, which may have hepatotoxic or toxicity related to her liver or kidneys. I can't, you know, just prescribe it just because you are having a migraine and you want something to sleep. Like that's not, I'm not gonna prescribe a controlled substance, but she's like, oh, Percocet has worked for me in the past. No, that's not the treatment for migraines. But more importantly, it's controlled. And my DEA license is gonna, you know, I'm not gonna do that. So. You know, um, I think a lot of people um, are now seeing what patients um, in communities of color 
may have had to deal with. And on top of it, there is this anxiety, but some of them are so strong and so resilient that I just applaud them for that. But I also try to reassure them that, you know, just hang in there and we try to put um, systems in place that help to allay their fears. For example, the appointment that they need, you know, to um, keep, um, hopefully they will keep those appointments and know that despite us not having a face-to-face -face visit, at least I will speak with you. Um, so this is like one of my working patients who um, relocated to live with his parents in the Lower East Side. And he can be a little nervous at times. Um, Good morning, Dr. Jaina. It's Giovanni. I'm so sorry I missed your call. Yes, I did send you a text earlier this morning because the weather is so bad. It's very windy and coming down like really, really hard. And the transportation is horrible. So I was just wondering, you know, I know today will be my last med. I don't have any more. Uh, today I, I will take the last one. But I could come and see you tomorrow if it's possible. Um, call me back or shoot me a text. I know you're streaming a bit, um, but I definitely have to see you this week because I have no medicine at all. Um, so they really, really try to work with what they have. Like here it is, it was that horrible rainy week and he couldn't get there. But you know, they are just such troopers. Um, they're just the strongest people I've ever, they inspire me every day my patients. I don't know how they do it. And I know it's scary for them. So I try to also have the case managers who are part of the team. Um, so not only the nurses who do the vitals and do the, ver the prior authorization for medications and just find out what their chief complaints are, but also the case managers who can help them work out some of the administrative issues with insurance or with, you know, their housing and things like that. So I have to, you know, delegate those responsibilities to the other members of the team. Yeah, I definitely think that if there's one thing that this pandemic has highlighted, like you mentioned earlier, it's definitely the racial disparities um, and just the inequity in terms of access and in terms of resources, in terms of uh, proximity being close to doctors, being close to hospitals. I've heard a lot of um, people share similar accounts and mm -hmm. similar anxieties over just how fast they can receive treatment or how mm -hmm. fast they can actually even get an appointment. Mm -hmm. um, that's one question I had for you. Um, and I'm sure Bethany's wondering the same thing because we've been hearing Governor Cuomo sort of uh, laud the state and talk about the increase in testing and how we're getting there. So talk to us a little mm -hmm. bit about whether or not this is actually happening and, and how, what's your perspective on, on mm -hmm. testing? So I remember early on in like February, I was talking to um, one of the nurses who was asking my opinion. Um, and I think at the time, the general term like testing is, in, is gonna be needed. Um, and I remember feeling frustrated that they were saying that, uh, and again, I don't know if it was Cuomo or I, I know it wasn't Dr. Fauci. Um, he's someone I, you know, as an infectious disease and the uh, former director of the NIH and the um, Department of Allergy and, and Infectious Disease and Immunology. He's he's just amazing. He demonstrated back in the HIV um, early days how um, important and, and the seriousness around um the pandemic of hiv so i just um look forward to always hearing his take on issues on a daily basis but it was um just the reality of having testing on a, the way it was presented wasn't really practical right so unless you have so two things one is what the tests show us the availability of the tests and how that's going to be used. So the most important reason of getting the test for getting the test is to acquire data so that you can make decisions about what to do. Most of the way that COVID presents, most of the symptoms which are myalgias, which are muscle aches, arthralgias, which are bone, bone pain, um, 
lethargy, tiredness, sore throat, uh, neck pain, headache, high fevers, shortness of breath, and a dry cough. So those symptoms, which I've heard like almost every day for the last three months, um, more more when I was on call that, that week, um, that those symptoms can happen anytime. You might have one symptom, you might have three, you may have multiple, but the fact that it doesn't follow a specific pattern, um, when you're gonna make the diagnosis, you have to be able to, um, it's made by virtue of having those symptoms, meaning you shouldn't need a test to confirm what you already know. So the value of a test, it's almost like someone with, um, if I had a patient with a headache and their blood pressure was 190 over 100, I know why they have the headache. I don't need to, to, do, to watch them for another three weeks to say they have hypertension. I already know it's clinically what it's showing us. I look in the back of their eye, I see changes in the back of their fundus that shows me it's hypertension. It's the same thing with this virus. Most clinicians already know, and we've known for the last few months, if you had any one, two, or more of those symptoms, which were atypical, which is, it's not the regular flu, it's not the regular cough. It's something that's prolonged or very, what we call atypical, not the usual presentation. If patients showed us that, then they were COVID positive, right? COVID-19 positive. We would not need the test to confirm that. So one is to push the test and, and not be able to say early on how it's gonna be utilized and the availability, it was frustrating. I, for one, definitely um, spoke about the importance of the antibody test because anyone who developed symptoms from early as you know, December, January, um, and I definitely had like something in February after attending a medical conference in Midtown, um, you know, this atypical thing. Um, I am not a smoker. I wasn't around um, anyone sick, but I did attend a, a, a large conference um, with people all over the country coming in. Um, so quickly after that, I developed a sore throat and chills and it was weird and I never called in on a Monday and I actually called into work that Monday. So this was early February. Um, the bottom line is the antibody tests would show us how many people are antibody positive. Now, an antibody test um, can mean, you know, without knowing what it shows, is something called IgM and IgG. I don't want to go into all the clinical details, but we have other viral markers that show us specifically what the antibody tests mean and what the PCR test, which is right now, what that means and the significance of it. If you don't have that like over a year and all that data, you can't really say, you can't really talk about how important it is. It is a little like sloppy, I feel like as a clinician, and I know Dr. Fauci was trying to, you know, eloquently and graciously <laughs> address, because he kept reiterating like without the data, we can't really say how we're going to move forward. We can just use what we have at the time to say what to do and how to, you know, continue to implement the social distance and of course hand washing and keeping people um, isolated um, as much as possible. So the tests for me are like a sore point because tests should be done to confirm what you already know. So people shouldn't think I need the tests to say if I'm positive or not. I had to tell so many patients when they called or presented with symptoms to stay home because most likely they were COVID positive. To have the antibody tests now or the PCR tests also will tell us just what to do as far as people going back to the community. So if I know for sure I'm antibody positive, um, so I've been going out anyway because I've been asymptomatic, um, but that can be used for data to look at different areas around the country. But so I'm gonna speak about New York. So if we know there's a highly, um, a high percentage of patients who are antibody positive in Riverdale, for example, 
then we may feel comfortable going to the supermarket. You know, we want to always wear our masks and do what we need to do. But as the, as compared to if I have a, I have a good friend in Harlem who um, they're like, oh, when are you guys going to come by to visit? If I know that the there's low antibody numbers, but high prevalence of PCR, then I may not choose to go there. So to have that data is extremely important for those reasons alone. The other part should be a clinical decision, not just get people randomly tested and then they like, I'm positive. And then there's all this anxiety. There's so much that needs to be put in place. And it's hard because we're doing this all in real time. So I just try to tell um, people who ask me questions, um, you know, who may be a friend's friend or my niece's friend or uh, that they should listen to three sources. The CDC website, for sure. It has everything updated. We have meetings at work where we go over the guidelines and the recommendations and then we implement those in our practice. Um, so the CDC website. Um, number two, um, you know, uh, Dr. Fauci. Um, he's my He's my guru, my mentor, my, you know, not only in a one, you know, of course my Jesuit background is near and dear to me, but from Fordham, uh, Cathedral High School, um, just he, he, he's just, he went to Holy Cross, but the way he delivers the information, so much of what goes on is about how people deliver the information. If someone's a nervous wreck and panicked and not, and all over the place, and I don't want to speak about any names because I don't ever want to politicize this, you know, pandemic, but there are people who we don't really listen to. Right? And there are other people who we look to for leadership and for knowledge. And that's where Dr. Fauci comes in. So on a day-to-day -day basis or whenever he is um, on the podium giving us an update, he's the, um, the source. Um, and third, for just everyday life um, guidance of uh, Governor Cuomo, just for what to look for on a day-to-day -day basis and how you should be um, living based on uh, living in terms of like going to the store or should I get on the train? What's happening with cleaning? You know, what's happening with those type of practical things, right? So it's the CDC website. It's not all this other stuff. It's Dr. Fauci. If you want to hear a voice of reason and an expert in virology, um, he wrote the chapter on my infectious disease. And again, as I mentioned, you know, around HIV and AIDS, he's just brilliant. Um, and he delivers it in such a calming way that you hear it and you don't get lost in the noise. And of course, Cuomo with every day, we're living in New York and he just basically, you know, tells you, tells it like it is. Um, so I just, those three sources, nothing else. And for my patients, I will, um, really map out if there's something there to have a question about. I'm the fourth source for them, for my patients. Yeah. Thanks so much for sharing that sure. advice, Dr. Peter. Um, sure. I mean, like you said, it's important not to politicize these things, but it's also important to know um, the right sources and the right people that we should be listening to because more than this just being a health uh, pandemic. It's also just a very anxiety producing and um, yes. like like you were discussing, just very traumatizing and I, and I think um, debilitating on like our sort of mental health mm -hmm. and our, our ability to just stay focused on, on who matters, what matters, and the right information. Yes. So since you were already giving us a little bit of advice, that would just be my last question. And then Bethany, if you want to ask any final thoughts? Because I know we've already taken up too much of your time. That's okay. That's okay. Um, I so I have a Zoom meeting with my great nieces and at 8.30. So I'm sorry. But, you know, they can wait. I, I don't think they... So Zoom for kids, right? I'm like, my nieces are near and dear to me. I have two sons, but my nieces are like... So they haven't called me yet. So if, if the kids... So they're nine years old. Um, and they have a Zoom account on their school tablet. So do they call me or do I, okay, they haven't called me. Do they usually call me or do I just call them? You would get a link to, um, to join a meeting. Okay. So it wouldn't be like so a I phone call or like FaceTime oh, or okay. like, a, like a regular phone that just sends out a call. It's going to be more direct where it's like, hey, you've been invited to this Zoom meeting and right, then you okay. join. 
okay, great. So I haven't received that yet. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Girls. Yeah, so you were going to ask Bethany, I'm sorry. Um, I think, I think obviously you've given some advice, like on sources. Um, I just would have to ask, do you have anything like specific in regards to like bronchitis in general? Mm -hmm. And then also, what would you think would happen if there was another sort of pandemic like this one in the near, in like in the future? Great. So I think education is key. And really establishing care um, with your primary care provider is important. So as a primary care provider, I know my patients, for whatever reason, they will look at me for um, reassurance, for information. Um, so I think getting into care, even if it's in a hospital-based primary care clinic, but having a place where you can go to have those questions answered, and not one thing this has shown us is that the emergency room is not the place to go for care unless it's an emergency. So my patients historically, I want to say for the most part, never use the ER unless I send them there. And then I speak to someone there who's going to see them for what I send them there for. It wouldn't be that they're like, oh, I have a sore throat and I can't get an appointment with you till next week. So I'm going to go to the ER. No, I'll call prescription for penicillin or you can make an appointment, just tell the secretary Tuesday to plug you in. Like getting and getting and establishing primary care is key. And I would say that's something to get ready for. Um, if this um, increase in cases does occur in the fall, because at least they will be a way to address whatever issues the patients may have. For example, my asthmatics. I wanna make sure they all have their pumps, they all have their albuterol, prescriptions with five refills. Um, I want to make sure that they have a nebulizer machine. Um, I'll argue down the insurance company if they try to not pay for it. Um, I have relationships with the pharmaceutical companies where if they want to, you know, utilize our patients in the community, guess what? Do you have any, um, you know, um, let's see, I don't want to say free things, but if you have any um, programs where you look out for patients who are undocumented or patients who are uninsured, like can they get a free whatever, if you guys want our business, then you have to help us out. So getting and establishing good primary care is key um, moving forward. And, you know, as I said, I have the um, patients who understand that, but there are new patients who go to Ryan who may see different people every time. They may see the medical residents and not really have that continuity, which is important. Um, the second thing I think is to make sure they're all vaccinated. So there's a lot of stigma and I understand like there's a lot of um, fear around the medical establishment. And I bring up commonly um, whenever I do educational programs, um, so I'm a speaker for, um, for one pharmaceutical company in particular. Um, so I will, I don't like speaking about uh, what they call a product. Um, they have slide decks that speak to, for example, HIV and the community, HIV and African Americans, HIV and Latinos, HIV and uh, men of color, um, uh, how to acknowledge, how to understand your lab tests. So whenever I do a presentation, I bring up the acknowledgement around not only health disparities, but understanding where that fear comes from when it comes to mistrust of the medical establishment and have to speak about Tuskegee and have to speak about a lot of the studies that were done in the, well, this particular study, which was significant and real and horrible, where, you know, these poor men who were in the army were left to have um, com complications of syphilis and develop neurosyphilis and developed heart disease as a result of untreated syphilis. And this was not, this was like in the 50s, we had penicillin. Like, why, how could you do that? Every time I think about it, it's frustrating because I prescribe penicillin on a regular basis for my patients with syphilis. Like, what were they thinking? But that's just blatant racism. That was horrible. So I acknowledge that when I'm speaking for pharma or whatever platform I'm at, 
but also to help patients to understand that we are where we are in terms of these diseases that continue to impact our communities. Um, and so we need to first face it, acknowledge it, but then educate around the practicality. No matter what people are thinking around, oh, this is the government, this is they're doing this, people are dying. Every single person I've spoke to knows someone who died. If it's not in their family, there's a friend of a friend. And these are people who not far-fetched like someone's cousin, sister's brother. This is Miss So-and-so who we saw every day. This is, you know, my uncle's girlfriend, whoever. These, this, is, this is really impacting our community in a way we have never seen before. And the reality is people are dying. So if the knowledge, I tell them, the knowledge is important, um, whether or not you don't believe it or not, or you want to go along with getting your vaccines, that's on you. If you don't want to take the antiretrovirals for HIV and your T cell is two and you catch something, I told you that, you know, your immune system, I mean, there, I hear this all the time, um, not from my patients, but from people who, um, yeah, there's so much out there. And so if I had to give people advice about what may be coming in the fall, it's one, education, two, two, getting into a good primary care clinic, whether it's a clinic like the Ryan Center, there are multiple of them all over New York, um, federally qualified health centers. And you can establish primary care, which are vaccinations, which are annual blood tests, treatment of underlying disease that may be um, unaddressed. Uh, you know, people can walk around with diabetes for years. These are the people who show up in the ERs and the ICUs who then all of a sudden the family shows up and it's like, oh, they're not doing this or that. But had they been in primary care to pick up on that uncontrolled hyperlipidemia, uncontrolled hypertension, diabetes that was uncontrolled. So getting into care so that your body can hopefully deal with the fact that you may be exposed to this virus, which is, you know, something that I've never seen before in my, you know, 30 some odd years of practicing medicine. So it's those those things and getting a provider you can trust that you can say anything to and not feel uncomfortable saying, guess what, you know, how do I know that this, you know, white male doctor, quote unquote, who has just seen me for the first time that I could tell him why I'm not ready to take a vaccine. So, you know, those type of things are key. Um, and I think very important. Yeah, well, I'm glad Bethany asked that because that was certainly going to be my same question. Just mm -hmm. the advice. Thank you for that advice. Sure. Um, I think I think it's important for a lot of communities of color to hear that message, and for those who are not who are not living or working within communities of color to also hear that message, mm -hmm. um, because a lot of times it's just it's either blatant ignorance or just no knowledge on the issues that are affecting these. Mm -hmm portions of the population. So thank you for that, Dr. Tim. You're welcome. Bethany, did you have any other questions? Uh, I would probably just ask, like, what are your final thoughts before we go? You know, any sort of final thoughts? Oh, yeah. So I want to say first, you know, thank you again for this opportunity to share my experiences um, around this pandemic, to have it documented, and for you to ask such thoughtful questions is really rewarding and again it's my honor um, to have it be in the Bronx which is definitely um, has the highest numbers out of all the boroughs around um, this uh, pandemic um, definitely in New York State it has the highest number um, of cases so to be um, even though I don't practice here in the Bronx but I had practiced for seven years seven years at Montefiore Medical Center and my former director actually Dr. Barry Zygman is uh, one of the key investigators around the medication that has significant promise for the treatment of COVID, um, not necessarily, but to prevent progression and worsening of the symptoms associated and to decrease hospitalizations. So to have worked with him um, and to have that right here in the Bronx is, you know, a historical um, point that, you know, I can't, um, you know, emphasize enough. Um, to have these two bright students who are definitely part of, I think, the importance of acknowledging um, what's needed um, in New York, in the Bronx, um, in communities of color. I could see that you guys are going to do amazing in your futures and keep doing what you're doing, um, you know, to hand the torch 
to my uh, Fordham family is always has always been important to me. And uh, again, I want to thank Dr. Nason for that because he really is one of the most encouraging, supportive, and just amazing and incredible professors to every set foot on Fordham's campus. Um, so I want to thank him for that. And just, you know, continue to um, keep the knowledge, you know, coming, keep the um, importance of community there. Fordham is a heart in the heart of the Bronx and to have this vast, um, this amazing university and not share what's, what goes on on campus um, is just, you know, I'm just happy to see that happening in the last, you know, few years. I mean, I think for a time there, Fordham um, was sort of behind the gates and, you know, Dr. Nason has definitely opened up the gates to do so many community projects to include where this vast, beautiful um, borough with so much to offer from music to, you know, um, of course, the, the African American History Project and all that it stands for is this is, um, again, one of the things that I think speak to the importance of that, that endeavor. So keep up the good work and thank you. Absolutely. Thanks again so much for joining us and for talking to us a little today, Dr. Taylor. Thank you. Take care. Thank yeah. you. Yes, Bye -bye. I want to reiterate that. Thank you so much for um, being here. And before we go, I just want to ask, could we get a picture? This is a oh, C-Step tradition, sure. but also I, I, this is a BHP tradition. All right. For sure. Yeah. <laughs> All right, smile, everyone. Okay. Ready? I'm trying to get you, Veronica. <laughs> Wait, hold on. Let me get my lighting better because I was like, okay, there we go. Okay. All right, there we go. Ready? Three, yeah. two, one. <laughs> Awesome. Thank, Thank you. you so much, y'all. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Oh, maybe can I have a picture real quick? Look at me. Okay, don't laugh. My son is always cracking up. Like, why do you want pictures all the time? Okay. There we go. Well, it shows me holding up the camera. So one, two, three. Thank <laughs> you guys. Thank of you course. so much. Take care. Thank you. Stay in touch. Yes, you have all my do. information. So stay in touch. Keep me posted. Good work. Thank you. Bye.